and the numbers on Mussini won his first seven starts of the year. As Brett Boone said in the opening, a fastball change and a knuckle curve. You cannot think with Mussini. He's very shrewd on the mound, and primarily because he controls both sides of the plate, inside and outside. First pitch of the ALCS is to Todd Walker. Strike one on the outside corner. It'll be Walker, then Miller, then Garcia Parra. We'll give you the rest of the batting order in just a second. As the Red Sox try to fill in for the injured Johnny Damon. There's Johnny with a little mouse over that right eye. He is, according to Grady Little, out for the first two games of this series. True to form, three pitches outside, inside off the plate, just misses away. He just, he's got no pattern. I mean, you can't, you, like you said, you can't guess with him. One ball, two strikes. Inside to Walker, and he chops it foul. Obviously, when you lose a guy like Johnny Damon, you are taking away an element that the Red Sox really can't replace. I mean, this is a team that is a plotting team. They are a team that pounds the baseball. But as far as a speed element getting on and making things happen, Damon is the one and only guy that can do that. Soriano. Wow. Take a look at the rest of the lineup for the Boston Red Sox. Brought to you by State Farm. We know about Todd Walker. How about Bill Miller, who's coming up? Nomar Garcia Parra hits third and short. Then it's Ramirez, Ortiz, and Millar with Nixon, Mirabelli, and Kepler. And this was a record-setting offense for the Boston Red Sox during the regular season. They barely scratched out enough in the division series against Oakland to advance to take on the Yankees. Here's Bill Miller. Batting champ takes the ball down and in. And there are the numbers against Oakland. This group hit only 211. So you're not going to see any averages or any big run production that'll knock you over, statistically speaking, for the Red Sox and what they did against A's pitching. The Yankees pitching in their division series against Minnesota was tremendous. Two up, two down. And with the bases empty, let's check in. Cast of thousands for this game. Here's Kenny Albert. Well, Joe, I spoke to Johnny Damon just before the game, as you mentioned, targeting a possible return on Saturday in Game 3. He told me he remembers waving to the crowd in Oakland on Monday following the collision, but he said he thought he was standing up, walking off the field, not lying on a stretcher. It's also not his first career concussion. He was a free safety in high school, a tight end by the name of Warren Sapp, came across the middle. That was career concussion number one. Joe? <laughs> Kenny, thanks. Wow. Well, that was a frightening collision, to say the least, and it's just good to see Johnny Damon up walking around and even talking about potentially playing over the weekend in Boston. Yeah, Warren Sapp a lot bigger than Damian Jackson, but Damian Jackson with that leverage hitting Damon on the right side of the forehead close to the temple. A frightening sight on Monday. I'll tell you what, it's I know what that feeling is though, when it's uh, when it's as loud as it is, you just can't hear your outfielder, you know, and, and I think I think uh, Jackson said after the game he said I wasn't gonna let that ball drop and I know that feeling but uh, it's easier with me and Ichiro he's you know we, we understand each other. No players. good. Yeah. <laughs> no communication barriers whatsoever with two out nobody on it's a one one pitch to Garcia Parra. High fastball for strike two and this crowd will get to its feet looking for a perfect first inning. Blowing the fastball by Garcia right around the letters. That's backing out of play. Garcia Parra, in his career in the postseason, is hitting 358. Trying to get on in front of Manny Ramirez. 
who had one huge swing of the bat in the division series against the A's. Two and two. Talk about a smart matchup. Nomar Garshapara, the valedictorian at St. Bosco High. And Mike Messina finished Stanford in three years. Two smart guys facing one another right here. <laughs> I finished. I finished SC in three years, but I don't have any paper. <laughs> Here's a 2-2 with two out. A little low, full count. And again, I just give the disclaimer here in the first inning with Tim McClellan behind the plate. I'm guessing along with you at home. Strike calls are a little tardy. Three balls, two strikes. To the right side, Posada. And it'll stay three and two on Garcia Parra. What about as a hitter? Brett, you, you can't take that long down there on the field for you to know if it's a strike or a ball. No, Timmy, uh, you know, he gives that illusion up here to everybody that's not in the batter's box that he's calling it late, but he'll let you know. He'll let the catcher know, he'll let the hitter know as soon as the ball crosses the plate quietly, and then it'll, and then it'll make his call. It's just his style. Talk about tough to hear. You can't be too quiet in here and be heard. 3 2 pitch to Nomar. Pitch was up. Garcia Parra pops it up, and it is a perfect first for Mike Messina. Dear Commissioner, Tim Wakefield will be floating that knuckleball to the plate here tonight in the Bronx. The starting lineup for the New York Yankees brought to you by State Farm. As you look at the numbers for Tim Wakefield, 409 ERA, 11 wins. Got into two games in the division series, and here is that lineup. Soriano will lead it off. Then Derek Jeter batting second. Giambi is the DH. Bernie Williams cleans up at a good division series. Posada, Matsui, Aaron Boone is at third base. Nick Johnson at first. Juan Rivera all of a sudden is a guy that Joe Torre wants to count on in right field. He's batting ninth. In lieu of a scouting report, we decided to give you a quote tonight that's pretty easy to remember. Hitting that thing, the knuckleball, is like trying to catch a butterfly with a pair of tweezers. <laughs> Said by a wise, ancient man. That's inside for ball one. That's too far inside. Soriano is leading off seven out of 19 in that division series against Twins pitching. You hear all kinds of theories about how best to try and figure out where the ball is going to end up. And one thing I hear, a theme that runs throughout just about every dugout when you talk to guys is moving up in the batter's box against a knuckleball pitcher. I think that's true. I think uh, I, I think it, it, it's like a left-handed changeup. You know, Tommy Glavin in the, in the mid '90s. I mean. Uh, when he was just at his absolute best. It's the same as knuckleball. You got to get in front of the box and, and catch it before it breaks. One ball, two strikes. Soriano leading off. And it's high, two and two. And that still doesn't always work, by the way. You were wondering. <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> well, that last one was a dangerous knuckleball. That's a ball right around the shoulders. Two, two. Popped up. Right side and easy for Nixon. One away. Leadoff man is gone. Jeter coming up. And again, we check in with Kenny Albert. Joe, after the top of the first, Yankee catcher Jorge Posada made a beeline for the grounds crew tunnel. The area behind home plate was uneven following player introductions. Grounds crew brought out the rakes and took care of it, Joe. Kenny, it might have been uh, Challenger, that beautiful bald eagle that came swooping in and I think was a little off course and scared the heck out of the guy stepping to the plate, Derek Jeter, who bats with one out and nobody on. Nuckers popped up to the right side, and it's Walker. Two out. Back in the pregame just moments ago.
with Derek Jeter and Soriano. Had the life scared out of him before the start of this game. That is one huge eagle. What are you saying, Tim? The wingspan on that thing was three players wide. Yeah. From Soriano, Soriano to Giambi. Soriano's fly down. Jeter's popped up. And Giambi takes ball one. Jason hit 250 during the regular season, 41 home runs. There's a strike. During the regular season, however, Giambi hit only 194 against the Red Sox. The entire left side of the infield almost is wide open with Giambi at the plate. It's the third baseman, Miller. It's almost playing up the middle like a shortstop might. American League teams do this uh, with Giambi, even with the fastball pitcher, but particularly with the knuckleball, slower ball. And right into the defense, Giambi grounds out to Walker. So a perfect first inning. Popcorn and a good seat with Manny Ramirez digging in right in front of him. It'll be Ramirez, David Ortiz, and Kevin Millar for the Red Sox. Each side went in order in the first. And that's a little low and away for ball one to Ramirez. Manny Ramirez had only four hits in that division series. He had three RBIs, which all came on one swing. And it gave the Red Sox just enough in game five in Oakland to advance. That slice down the right field line and foul for strike one. And then all anybody wanted to talk about after the home run wasn't so much him hitting it, but the way that he reacted to it. I'll ask you. Tim McCarver did that upset your night did that give you a bad stomach watching that well I mean it's it's part of baseball right now that's uh, that's what a lot of home run hitters do they admire what they just hit instead of running hard out of the box it's not appropriate but that's the way it is one hot shot to Jeter and the leadoff man is gone here in the second inning I Shall do, and I'll ask you. It's kind of a big question. It's a big picture thing. Our dynasty's good for baseball, Booney. Uh, if you're playing for one, <laughs> yeah, yeah that's you're, a good answer. If you're a Red Sox fan, no. That's right. That's right. <laughs> they haven't won since 1918. If you're a Yankees fan, of course. It's it's the best. <laughs> Are we looking at a dynasty with this New York Yankees team? I mean, here's a team that I think it's a pretty good argument since Joe Torre got here in 1996. His eighth year now they've won four World Series I mean this is a group that when the schedule comes out in February you mark down as a team that you expect to see in the postseason the 1 0 pitch to Ortiz is high for ball two well, I think people don't realize how hard it is to win and, and win the whole thing and these guys have done it in the last six seven years have won four rings I've been on some some very very good teams and I've uh, been lucky enough to go to one World Series and ended up losing to the dynasty so uh, it's tough but that's what you play for here's a 2 0 pitch Ortiz takes it on the outside corner two and one what a dynasties do they go out and try to get every player they can George Steinbrenner telling Brian Cashman back in May or actually uh, last winter but this guy Ortiz, we need this guy Ortiz. And Brian said, look, we've got Nick Johnson, Jason Giambi at first base. Where are you going to play him? Brian Cashman confirming that comment by the owner of the Yankees, the general partner of the Yankees, George Steinbrook. And if you talk to Joe Torre, he'll tell you the difference with this Boston team down the stretch is the guy at the plate, David Ortiz. He said he went from being... A guy that would flare hits up the middle, flare hits into left field, being a serious power threat. Hit 31 home runs during the regular season, and he takes low ball three. And, and limited at bats, too. He's been, uh, he was unbelievable. He beat us pretty good. They swept us in Boston, and uh, he was a big reason. He's, he kept it going. I mean, he's been their probably most valuable player his second half of the season. 0 for 20, however, against the man on the mound, Mike Messina. One out, base is empty here in the second with no score, and that's a one-out walk. One on, one out. Millar coming up.
from New York to Los Angeles. Jeannie with a game break. Mm, the NLCS underway in Chicago. Mark Pryor faced five batters top one, but when it mattered, with two on and two out, he found his groove. That's Miguel Cabrera. No score at Wrigley. And the Marlins with that win last night. You consider what they accomplished last night by coming off the deck down four to nothing before they could even blink. They come back. They blow a lead. They blow another lead. They come back. The Cubs get that emotional home run from Sosa. And they still end up winning on a Mike Lowell home run. And when you've got to face Pryor twice and Wood twice coming up, that's a game that if you're the Marlins, you've got to win. Without a doubt, without I think it's back to a couple of years ago when it was uh, Randy and Schilling. I mean, it's those are two horses. One on, one out, one zero pitch is inside. It's two and zero. We talked about how this postseason will wear you out if you're watching every pitch. Fourteen of the 19 games decided by two runs or less. Four extra inning games. Three of the four division series won by the quote unquote underdog. And then everything that happened in that Marlins Giants series, which every time you watched for 10 minutes, something crazy happened. And you could say a lot of the same things about the Boston Oakland series. One thing I don't think you could say about the Boston Oakland series is that Boston was an underdog to Oakland. And if they were, only slightly, the Yankees, favored by a ton over Minnesota, played their worst game of postseason under Joe Torre, that first game, and then just blew the Twins. Out of the tank. One game here at Yankee Stadium, the other two at the Metrodome in Minneapolis. It's three balls and a strike on Millar after a walk to Ortiz. Seen and not typically a guy that you have to worry about control. Come in in a matchup like this, and you think that about Wakefield. And seen as a guy who walked only 40 during the regular season. Less than two per nine innings, fourth in the American League. Good hitting count for Millar. And he floats one into left field. Coming to get it, Matsui. Nice catch. Ortiz scampers back to first with two out. I think, I think the, the reason Mike is, is his walk total so low, he's got that ability to throw the ball just out of the hitting zone, but to the, to the hitter, it looks like a good pitch to hit. And there's not too many guys that have that ability. Uh, you know, 2 0, he'll throw you a pitch just out of the zone. You think it's right down the middle coming out of his hands, and next thing you know, you're fouling it back. So I think that has a lot to do with it. There also are not that many right handed pitchers who have a better percentage getting out left handed hitters than they do right handers. Right handers hitting 247 against Messina, and left handers 230. Reason for that, the knuckle curve ball. He'll cut the ball in on the lefty's hands, too. Mm -hmm. Running in off the plate. We've seen him do it a couple of times. He's changed. I mean, he's changed over the years. He's, he's come up with, you know, he's making an adjustment. Later in his career, he's going to different pitches, and he's he's able to, he's throwing a changeup. Now he's throwing a split. He has a left-hander at the plate now in Trot Nixon. Hit that game-winning home run in extra innings in game three of the division series. Back at Fenway Park. One ball, no strikes. Runner at first, two out, and Messina falls behind Nixon, 2 0. Oh. Been behind the last three hitters. He walked Ortiz, got Millar on a 3 1 pitch, and now has to find the strike zone with a 2 0 -oh count on Trot Nixon. Don't know if that would have been a strike, but with Posada having trouble catching it, no chance, and it's three and zero. Oh. Yeah, usually pitchers will not get this as a strike, even though it was low anyway. I think you got to turn Nixon loose right here, a 3:14 porch down the right field line. A lot of people don't talk about it, but right field at Yankee Stadium, the ball just shoots out of this ballpark. Too wide and two walks in the inning. 
So two on with two out and the backup catcher. And he is a backup catcher because of the playing time that Veritek gets. Doug Mirabelli walks in. It was two for four in this postseason and hit 258 during the regular year. You hear a lot about the green monster in Boston. What you don't hear a lot about is the blue monster here <laughs> at Yankee Stadium. It used to be 296 down the right field line. I think it still is. It was Do you? Yeah. <laughs> With two on, two out. It's a great place to play. Ortiz, the lead runner at second, does not have good speed. Calf injury has slowed down Nixon. He's the runner at first. Mirabelli could put Boston out in front here in the second. Up and away, 2-0. Eleven of the last 13 pitches that Messina's thrown have been outside the strike zone. Mirabelli will be looking to crush a 2-0 pitch, and it's outside 3-0. I think Mel Stottlemyre asking Joe Torrey where that pitch was. That's the one thing you can't see from the dugout, whether the pitch is outside or inside. You can determine height. That ball was outside. Now a 3-0. Three balls and a strike. A lot of times from the side, side view, what, what the manager's looking for, a coach is looking for, is where his catcher sets up. If he hits the glove, you know, he might be sitting just off the plate. But they're, they're looking where he catches the ball and, and assumes it's a strike. We've seen his pitch running back, hitting the inside part, and now a 3 1. Full count. The runners will take off on this 3 2 pitch. And that's important for the Red Sox because both runners are slow. Ortiz at second base and Nixon at first. Perhaps the only way they'd score on a ball hit sharply to the outfield. Easy back to Messina. And after a little bout with wildness, Messina able to come back, get Mirabelli, and end the top of the second. Two left for Boston. Williams, Posada, Matsui coming up for New York. Here in New York, we move to the Bronx and Yankee Stadium. The place it was built in 1923. As Bernie Williams leans back from strike one. Now the Boston Red Sox, because they had to play a team across the country in Oakland in the division series, went Boston to Oakland, Oakland to Boston, Boston to Oakland, and then Oakland back to Boston leading into this series. There's no truth to the rumor that they flew Wakefield through Des Moines just to make sure he was extra tired so he didn't overthrow that knuckleball. He is trying to make that thing dance, dart, dive, jump, flip, roll over, whatever it is. And I would imagine, guys, it's a surprise somewhat for Wakefield where the ball ends up after he lets it go. Well, the one thing he tries to do is to keep the wrist stiff and the elbow stick. Shallow left field, Manny Ramirez goes to get it, and the leadoff man is gone here in the second. Posada coming up. Let's go back to Jeannie at the Fox Network Center. And in Chicago, Randall Simon says, I can make contact with other things besides hot dogs. Base is loaded, two outs. The single sends on Mark Rizalonic, sends on Sammy Sosa. It's the end of the first two nothing Cubs. So the Cubs say, there you go, Mark Pryor. There are your two runs. Go get them. Was here. Like a sausage, not a hot dog. How about that? Yeah, that was. It was the it was Italian sausage. sausage. Yeah. And Randall Simon gets the base hit to put Chicago on top. <laughs> Look at these guys diving out of the way of strikes. Uh, it's interesting to note that all pitchers will use the seams for leverage, whether it's a fastball or curveball or a slider, even a changeup. But even knuckleball pitchers, you tell with Tim Wakefield. 
And there's that stiff release. The knuckleball really is a misnomer. You use the fingertips to push the ball toward home plate. Most of the time, you don't throw it. You push it up there. That stayed up, and Posada hopped on it and gets a one-out base hit to right. And, Joe, you're talking about, about fatigue and Tim Wakefield as Posada gets the first hit of the game. You're talking about fatigue. Rarely will a manager take a knuckleballer out of the game because he's tired. It's only because he's ineffective, because they could throw all day. Wilbur Wood, 30 years ago, started a doubleheader for the Chicago White Sox. Both games. Both games. Yes, sir. One on, one out for Matsui. Hideki Matsui, who hit that game three home run for the Yankees. A big shot in their win that afternoon at the Metrodome. Takes a strike. For a knuckleballer, a pitch count of 150 is not a problem. <laughs> Unless it's in the first inning. There are a lot of guys. It says unknown, but there are who, who is a, lot of, a lot of pitching coaches. <laughs> well and away, one ball, one strike. Now I know the first one we didn't put the answer to who that was, but I have a feeling. Do you know who said that second one, or is that just I do not. No. Unknown. It's like anonymous. One ball, one strike. Might have been taken off a gravestone someplace. Who knows? <laughs> Here's another one. Very uh, literary friendly broadcast we have for you. It's like a butterfly with hiccups. Really startling. One ball, one strike, one on, one out. And that's too wide, two and one. One thing you have to do, whether you catch it or hit it, that was a curveball right there. First curveball of the game by Wakefield. Look for that knuckleball. The, first, the one thing you have to do if you catch it, you have to wait. And if you hit it, you have to wait for it to develop. Well, he'll throw that curveball when he when he gets behind in the count and needs to throw a strike. Sometimes instead of throwing the fastball, he'll throw that curveball. I think he feels like he has a little more control on it. He's three and one on Matsui. Runner goes. And a tap foul right at home plate. So the Yankees, and that was really something that we talked about a lot with Joe Torre when he first came to New York back in 1996. Starting runners, a more National League style game, and against the knuckleballer, Torre sent Posada on that 3 1 pitch. It was probably the first fastball he's thrown tonight, right there. I don't think uh, Matsui is looking for the fastball. He won't get it here either. <laughs> no. Runner goes on three and two, and another tap foul. Doug Mirabelli had 13 pass balls this year. He caught all but two innings of Wakefield's 202 and a third innings. Regular catcher of the Red Sox is everybody knows Jason Veritek. He had a terrific year and in large part responsible for the Red Sox being here tonight for that play made in game three blocking off Eric Burns of Oakland blocking him off a home plate. And really just what he does all year. I he mean, does. He, he is, is back there night after night after night. He is a leader on this team. Hunter goes and another foul by Matsui and there are certain guys you can look at. And you can you can know from a distance that his teammates respect what he does. And Veritek is a guy that you know is in that category. And when you talk to his teammates, they verify that. Nomar did not shave his head. Johnny Damon did not shave his head. Other than that, everybody for this Boston team, good luck, solidarity, all shaved their head. Grady Little. Grady Little. Yeah. It's an appropriate night for the bald eagle to open the festivities. <laughs> and there's that. Uh, uh, Here's a 3-2 again. Matt Silly dumps a base hit into left field. And Posada will hold it second, two on one out. Jorge Posada is not a good base runner. When you're running on this count right here with one out, against 
Manny Ramirez, in my view, you got to try to take third base. Ramirez is not a good left fielder. You're running with the pitch. By the time the ball gets to Ramirez, he's a little past third base. If you're thrown out at third, in my view, that's a good base running play. Try to get got the, the bottom one. part of the order yeah. here. Including Aaron Boone, bottom part of the order. The number seven hitter, three out of 15 against Minnesota. In the division series, he takes a strike. And he is the brother of the man sitting to my right, Red Boone. Hey. <laughs> I don't have too much to say. That's I work, all right. I work sit with, back and watch. I worked with him last night on the knuckleball. Let's see how he does. <laughs> two on, one out. No balls, one strike. A big rip. It's 0-2. It's not what I told him. So it stays 0-2. And that knuckleball stayed up. We've seen a lot of these knuckleballs. If you talk about Wakefield, it's important to get the ball down. A lot of these knuckleballs have been up, and that is ripped down the left field line foul. It's still 0-2 on Aaron Boone. I think Aaron has a hairline fracture in that bat. A lot of times you can't see those little cracks. Because of the pine tar on the, on the bat. Hit that one off the trademark. No balls, two strikes. Wakefield, no strikeouts yet. Tied the first four and has given up back to back hits to Posada and Matsui. Hard hit and foul down the left field line. Another pitch that was up and Boone jumped on it. That was close. If it goes over the bag and hits foul, it's a fair ball. But clearly, that ball foul. Well, if you talk to Tim Wakefield and you say, what are the perfect conditions for the knuckleball when you're on the mound, they'll tell you a little breeze blowing at him. And there is a little breeze down there on the field. More or less blowing across. I've seen a lot of these knuckleballs stay up. That one dives down and the count, one ball, two strikes. A 3.35 ERA in his career here at this stadium as Boone hits another foul. Aaron Boone picked up at the trading deadline from Cincinnati. Gabe White, a left-hander, came with him. Gabe White has done so much to impress Joe Torre along with Felix Heredia that Chris Hammond has been left off this ALCS roster. That's popped up. Shallow center and Kepler comes on. Two up. Don Mattingly used to say, the great first baseman of the Yankees, used to say that when the bat handle is facing the Yankee dugout, then the ball is, or the wind is blowing toward the dugout. And that's where it's blowing tonight. So there is some wind resistance here at Yankee Stadium. And in case you were wondering about that low pressure system, which I know you all are, it's somewhere uh, on the East Coast south of here. Or it could be a high pressure system, for all I know. The clouds. Two on, two out. And the batter is Nick Johnson as he takes the ball up and away. As long as uh, those things aren't there. Timmy, you're Doppler. <laughs> He's gone Doppler on. No, Joe Doppler is our partner. That's fouled back to the screen. One ball, one strike. Anybody who's watching in a bar somewhere with the sound off just saw that. Somewhere along the East Coast. I thought he was watching home. the weather chat. Yeah, and called home. <laughs> Honey, did you see that? What's coming our way? 
Where are you? Why are you watching that game? <laughs> one and one with two on, two out. On the inside corner. So there, it's all clear. Don't do anything to it. Put all clear or something. No. No, we are clear, obviously. No hurricanes in sight. And really, the weather is absolutely gorgeous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Our weathermen for this ALCS game one. One ball, two strikes on Nick Johnson with two on, two out. 67 degrees at game time. Full moon. That's all I got on that. Full moon. It's enough. <laughs> One ball, two strikes. Juan Rivera, the number nine hitter on deck. Two and two. Nick Johnson, a very good hitter with two strikes. Other than Derek Jeter, there is no Yankee more proficient going the other way with two strikes. Gary gets the ball to right field with two strikes, and Johnson's very good at going to left field with two strikes. It's a to first. It stays fair somehow. And the inning will come to a close. The ball looked like it was going to go foul, but as you all know, when you hit a knuckleball down the right field line, the first baseline, 9-1-2, and two, the hitters for Boston here in the third inning. And a check swing. No swing in ball one as we go back to that ground ball by Johnson, who slipped getting out of the box. And any chance of beating that ball, which had Kevin Millar well behind the bag, went out the window on that. As Kapler lines one into right, right at Rivera. The leadoff man is gone. Here in the third, let's check in again with Jeannie Zelasco for a game break. And more from Wrigley. And prior to this scene, Mark Fryer had given up a double, a single, but he got out of trouble with two strikeouts and a pupper. The Cubbies clinging to the 2 nothing lead. I say clinging because look out for those Marlins. Bottom two. So they have had chances to score on Fryer in the first and second innings. The more you see of Mark Pryor, the more you just marvel at how good he is. He was big league ready coming out of USC. Spent about 18 seconds in the minor leagues. With one out, nobody on, Walker pops it up. That's Bernie Williams, and that's two out. Tomorrow, baseball's postseason continues at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific on Fox with game two of this ALCS. Derek Lowe and Andy Pettit. What a game Pettit pitched in the division series against Minnesota. And Derek Lowe did a little bit of everything for Boston. And Friday at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific, game three of the NLCS. As they go to Miami, Kerry Wood takes the hill for the Cubs against Mark Redmond. Sports' biggest month of the year continues tomorrow only on Fox. As a strike is poured into Bill Miller. Cubs and the Marlins going down to South Florida, of course, for game three. The Marlins drawing 130,000 people for the two games played against the San Francisco Giants there. One ball, one strike. A series that ended with Pudge Rodriguez making a play at the plate. That's the first time in postseason history that a series has ended with the play at the plate. Well, when you think of the, what Pudge Rodriguez has done, as Miller fouls one out of play off to the left, here's a guy who late signs a one-year deal for $10 million. And if he doesn't go back to the Marlins for some big discount, he has earned himself a huge contract next year. He's right back in the forefront. What he's done with that pitching staff, what he's done at the plate, Real leader on that team. One two pitch. Two, two. That's if the owners resort to doing what they did prior to last winter. And that was signing guys to a lot of long term contracts. Last winter. Uh -huh. That is fair down the third baseline into left. It kicks out to Matsui. 
well played and it's a two out single for Bill Miller. Let's go back to Los Angeles. Jeannie Zalasco will be busy. Here she is. Oh, but it's great. Now, I know you saw it on the screen and you're wondering now how in the heck did the Cubs get another run? This is how a good trade the deadline trade will help you out. Kenny Loft and RBI single up the middle. The Cubs had a three zip lead line too. So now with Miller on and two out, thanks, Jeannie. Here's Nomar Garcia Parra who fly to center his first time. A notorious first ball hitter. He swung at more first pitches than any other major leaguer this year. Hey, come on. Sorry. Strike one. Look at that, huh? Graphically backs you up. He saw that before. Uh, he did. Yeah, he I must did. have. He's cheated. Did. That's why you get out here at 2.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> cheated. <laughs> Nobody likes him, Tim, but that's okay if you want to be one. <laughs> no balls, one strike, Garcia Parra. That stays inside, one and one. That was close. That was one of those pitches that when it crossed the plate, it stayed inside, but Posada caught it in the strike zone. One and one on deck is Ramirez Garcia Parra trying to turn that two out single into something strike two. And this crowd which has been for the most part quiet here early. will try to crank it up behind Messina here in the third. Two third and foul. I know Jeannie's just waiting for the right time to jump back in here. Because I see up on the scoreboard, it's now five to nothing Chicago. That's what we'll be looking at all night. Well, there's no score here in New York in the top of the third. Still one and two. That last pitch was the best swing that any Red Sox has had at Messina tonight. He just misses this pitch. Good pitch, good location too. Messina has yet to pick up a strikeout. Garcia Parra trying to drive one, and instead he pops it up. do it for the Red Sox here in the third there is no score it's the bottom of the third and it's the nine one and two hitters now for the Yankees that means Juan Rivera Alfonso Soriano and Derek Jeter against the knuckleballer Tim Wakefield who delivers ball one Tim Wakefield was on the 1999 Boston Red Sox a team that lost to the Yankees in five games in the ALCS as that shattered bat ends up all the way behind Miller at third base and shallow left. And it's one and one on Juan Rivera. So one thing you don't normally see with the knuckleball pitcher, you don't see him break many bats. That one sawed right off the trademark. Talk about Tim Wakefield and pitching against the Yankees. He lost one of those games when the Yankees won it in 1999. They won it in five. Here's 1-1. One, one. Late swing, strike two. The last time Tim Wakefield won a postseason game was back in 1992 when he pitched for Pittsburgh. In fact, he was going to be the MVP of that playoff series until Doug Drabeck carrying a 2 nothing lead into the bottom of the ninth inning. Open the doors for Francisco Cabrera to win it for the Braves. The Pirates won in that 
NLCS only to lose to Atlanta and just so you know the MVP of that series became John Smoltz instead of Wakefield after the Cabrera hit to send Atlanta to the World Series one out nobody on Soriano who flies to right fouls it strike one. Wakefield got around two hits in the second and Soriano takes a strike it's 0 2. No telling how good Alfonso Soriano is going to be you just wonder if second base is going to be his long term position everybody expects Soriano at some point and maybe next year to shift into the outfield. I think he had to make the, the transition coming up uh, I think he was a shortstop and, and with Derek. Uh, Playing short for the Yankees, there wasn't much room, so they put him over at second. I think he's kind of learning on the job, but uh, offensively, this guy, I was impressed with his first year, but the last two years, he's just getting, he's getting better. It, this guy's going to be something. With one out, nobody on, no balls, two strikes. Soriano took just inside ball one. We talked about it before, Tim. Doesn't matter what sport it is. That combination of power and speed is so rare. He has it. There's a guy with 38 home runs, 35 stolen bases. And he achieved that same lofty status a year ago. It's almost as though his speed at second base is wasted. If he were a center fielder, for instance, he has a strong enough throwing arm. And perhaps the Yankees next spring will move him to center and Bernie Williams to left field. There has been talk of that. But at second base, that defensive speed that you see offensively is the wrong position for that. Here's Todd Walker who gets it on one hop. Wide throw, but Millar able to get his foot back on the bag. Two up, two down, and you look at a guy who is without a doubt a double threat. Only players with 35 or more home runs, 35 or more steals in consecutive seasons. And you look at the greats, Mays, Bonds. And now Soriano. That's it. He's 0 for 2 tonight. And with the bases empty, two out here's Jeter. And there's a pop-up. So the knuckleball is working for Wakefield. And Miller juggles and makes the catch. And Wakefield ends up face down. Well, Wakefield tried to grab Miller so Mirabelli could make the play. He's trying to pull Miller out of the way and unsuccessful. And by America Online, look for 9.0 optimized coming this fall. First pitch is a strike. From Mike Messina to Manny Ramirez. It's Ramirez, Ortiz, and Millar. If anybody gets on Nixon for the Red Sox, Boston has one hit. The Yankees have two. No balls, two strikes. It's Messina against Wakefield tonight. Derek Lowe and Andy Pettit tomorrow night, and then game three in Boston. Already getting some headlines. Roger Clemens against Pedro Martinez. Same matchup we had back in 1999, and with all the hype, it ended up a 13 to 1 Boston victory. The only win they got in that ALCS. And 0 2. Foul. Dangerous. Dangerous into those seats down the left side. The count's still 0 2. Ramirez grounded out to short his first time up. And just sticking the bat out. Messina knocks it away, and that is a base hit. Any chance of picking up an out on that play? 
Went out the window and Messina got a glove on it. Uh, normally Mike Messina makes this play. He is terrific at fielding his position. And by the time it was deflected towards Soriano, looked like he tried to scoop it over there, Brett. That's, I mean, that's a do or die. You either get it done or you don't. He's just trying to flip it to, to nick it first. And, you know, that's one of those things where you, sometimes you make it, sometimes you don't. But it's, uh, I, I don't think he had a chance on that one anyway. I think he was too far down the line. David Ortiz now with one on, nobody out. Ortiz walked his first time. The second, Messina got wild. Walked to, fell behind every hitter, but got away with it as he hits the outside corner for strike one. Ortiz 0 for 20, as we showed you, his first time up in his career against Messina. During the regular season, this Boston Red Sox team had 26 home runs against Yankee pitching, and Ortiz had six of them. Had four in less than 22 hours on that Friday, Saturday. Back in July, Friday night, Saturday afternoon, four home runs in less than 24 hours. Messina has him set up at 0-2. Tough situation for Messina here because American League pitchers try to pitch Ortiz inside to get him out. You don't want to risk that with Johnson holding the runner at first base. Too many mistakes. Posada pointing to his head saying, You've got a it's 0-2. Don't throw him a strike. There's one up and in, ball one. A lot of times catchers just have little reminders to the pitcher of what the count is. Pitchers are trained to throw the ball in the strike zone, not out of it. 0-2, it's different. Now a 1-2. Shot again, 2-2. Two two. Way here. And Ortiz just got a piece. Remember the two fastballs that missed inside? The reason for that, he wanted to go away to get him out. And Ortiz stays alive. A little cue shot foul. Boston offense still trying to find that groove they had during the regular season. A 2 2 delivery. That's too wide. It's a full count. So Messina had Ortiz at 0 2. And now the count's full. Really no reason not to send Ramirez right here. Ramirez looking at first base coach Dallas Williams. Sometimes he'll wink at him. If he misses the steal sign. I would suspect he's running here. He is going, and Ortiz pounds a home run into right. The Red Sox lead 2 0. Upper tank. Off the bat of Ortiz, who gets his first ever hit against Messina and takes him out of the park. His seventh home run against Yankee pitching this season. <laughs> Messina got ahead 0 and 2, trying to make that perfect pitch. Ortiz battled enough. And Ortiz has put the Red Sox on top here in the fourth. Nobody on or out, and Millar takes strike one. David Ortiz's wheelhouse. You can see Posada sitting inside, the ball tailing back over the fat part of the plate. He hit that ball a ton. 
Brett, you were saying before the game that the one thing about Messina is he throws few pitches down the heart of the plate. I mean, you saw that right there. He got a head 0-2. He goes to, uh, then he throws the pitch around the strike zone and, and didn't throw a strike until he had to. And you know, it was a good job by Ortiz to work the count back to where he got it, 3-2. On 0-2, Millar strikes out. Messina gets his first strike out of the night. Ortiz, a low ball hitter. And does he get all of this one? <laughs> That's a good feeling. <laughs> I bet it is. <laughs> there he is, Timmy, breaking it down for you. Admiring his work, as you said. Yeah. <laughs> like an artist. Old school. <laughs> like, like an artist looking at an easel. With one out, the batter is Trot Nixon. And he goes up there ready to rip. Strike one. You've got a little style to you there too Brett I mean it's not like you're you're not Scott Rowland yeah. setting the bat down and sprinting around the base uh, Timmy's been waiting for that one uh, I mean it's about time that we just get it out in the open I mean it's been sitting there since the first inning and what are you referring to your little bat flip oh man. you hit the home run you flip the bat and you do your style around the base <laughs> That evolved though. That evolved. I've always flipped the bat. I've just added a little. Yeah, a little flare, a little, a little flare, a little flare. <laughs> you know, I don't mean anything by it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you in a minute after this pitch. Okay. <laughs> With one out, nobody on, one ball, one strike. You know, I don't mean anything by it. Nixon grounds a base hit to the right of Soriano, and a good job by Rivera to go over and cut it off. One on, one out. It just it started for me. It was uh, you know pitchers striking me out and pumping their fists and doing a dance on the mound, and I had no problem with it. I, I didn't get offended by that, but I had a little flip, and uh, I hope they don't get offended. Yeah, well, <laughs> can't blame a guy. I run though. I run. I mean, this is part of the game. I this stuff doesn't bother me at all. But I, I have never stood down in that field trying to get these guys out. Timmy. You know, a little flair, a little emotion, a little showboating. It's, I know, it, it upsets a lot of people, but if it's not done a ridiculous amount, exactly. it's a big deal. It's, it's baseball. I think you got to have fun, and today's game is different than it was uh, years ago. Pitchers are doing, pumping their fists. Hitters are hitting home runs and, and watching them a little bit. You see a lot more hitters hitting home runs and watching it a lot than you see pitchers pumping their see, fists. See, now you got All it. right, here we go. You got me. Here we go. How many pitches? I mean, Derek Lowe did it after the Red Sox clinch the other night, saying that that the manager of the Athletics, Ken Maka, said he was a number three starter, and Rick Peterson, the pitching coach, and he made what the Athletics said was an obscene gesture to the Oakland dugout. For those in it, not to the dugout, but the guys in it. Well, I, I, I didn't see it. You know, I know Derek a little bit. I played golf with him. He doesn't seem like that type of guy to me. Does but I did not, I did not see the, the. Uh, you know, I saw him the strikeout, but then I kind of tuned away, and uh, you know, I heard a lot the next, the next day in the paper. Timmy, speaking of bat flips, you know the home run I remember you hit when you, you hit the grand slam. Yeah, oh yeah. When I passed. If you'd have had a bat flip and walked a little bit. You might not have passed it. That's a very That's one more home for you. That's one it. more. That, that would happen in 1976 when I passed Gary Maddox of the Phillies. I was there. Yes, you were. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> That's long away. Two balls, two strikes. For those of you who may not know, Bob Boone, Brett's father, and I were teammates with the Philadelphia Phillies for a lot of years. But perhaps you're right. To rethink that. I should have. Had you styled a little you bit. Should've. Styled a little, flipped the bat. Maybe I would have Yeah, maybe a twirl. Two balls, two strikes, one on, one out. Two out. Let's go out to Los Angeles and check in with Jeannie for another game break. What's going on well, in Wrigley? You know, this Cubs and Marlins series is supposed to be short on offense and long on pitching. How about another long ball? Aramis Ramirez does the honors. Brad Penny is polished, done for the night. Paul Bacco here with an RBI double. That one off Nate Bump. To the bump of the scoreboard. Seven nothing. Cubs bottom three. Jeannie, thanks. With a runner at first here and two out. The 
Cena deals and that's up and in ball one one of the effects a lopsided score like that could have at Wrigley as you look what happened last night for nothing early through two innings and the final score was nine eight but if it stays as lopsided as it is you could see a guy like Mark Pryor maybe get a little bit more of a break at the end of the ball game if you're going to bring him back later on in this series to be that much stronger at Wrigley Field it's got to be very lopsided that's true I'll, I'll accept that yeah I think he's gonna you know it's still he's gonna go as long as, as his, his manager thinks he needs to win this game I mean it's it's crunch time man. yeah well whatever. one one pitch that's foul outside third it's just something to think about for later in the game did you that's whatever it. me I whatever you all right Oh, that line the, is. I'll, be, I'll remember that. He does that to it, me all the time. Don't I thought this was that. get on Tim in it. No. Okay. Fourth inning here. One ball, two strikes, one on, two out. Two and two. The word sharp. Would you use it tonight for Mike Messina? He's been a little off. No. I think walking two batters in the second inning is an indication of, of how off he is tonight. Of course, you can change. I mean, you, you've got to stay with the pitcher. If he comes out in the first few innings, doesn't have his stuff, you just have to keep being innovative behind the plate. Two and two on Kapler and didn't look good on that swing. But David Ortiz did on this after a leadoff hit by Manny Ramirez. Ortiz on a 3 2 pitch has put Boston on top in the fourth inning of game one. It's two Giambi is on the outside corner for a strike. Giambi, Williams, and Posada, the three, four, and five hitters for New York. And it's Boston up 2-0 on the Ortiz home run. One and one. Talk about it now or should we wait for later? Go through the specifics or does everybody know about it? Sold here for the 1920 season. The Yankees from that point on amassed their 26 world championships. The Red Sox in their history have five World Championships, but none since they sold Ruth to the Yankees. All between 1903 and 1918. It's in foul ground, and it's Mirabelli who takes in out number one. And you look at the division titles, the American League pennants. Red Sox haven't won one since 1986 in that heartbreaking World Series loss to the Mets. And that bottom point, the Red Sox have finished second to the Yankees 13 times. This year they did it again. Since 1938, it's only happened the other way once, and that was in 95 when Boston won the division, and the Yankees were the wild card team. The first year of that wild card extra team format. History class is now finished. Brett Boone, you can refocus on the game at hand. The 1 0 pitch is a little bit high. It's 2 0. We, as broadcasters, and I say that, Brett, including you, because you've now. Because I am. You've been downgraded to our level. I didn't like going through your security. I know. Get in. Got I really checked, didn't like it. And they show his pass. It was kind of fun. 2 0 pitch is right down the heart. Two and one. You almost feel compelled, Tim, to go through all that stuff, lay it out there, and now it's. Time I told to him. I said, "Don't you know who I am? Aaron Boone's brother." <laughs> Let me through. And they continue to rifle through your bag. <laughs> on two and one, with one out, nobody on. Williams reaches up, pops it into right, and Nixon is there for out number two. Before this game, I did not know which way Bernie Williams a switch hitter would hit against Tim Wakefield because 13 at bats prior to tonight he's batted right handed against Wakefield a high knuckler 
That's a real floater. Williams doesn't get enough of it to get it out of here. But many times he has come up to the plate right-handed against a knuckleballer. Some guys do that. But two out, nobody on. Posada, another switch hitter, batting left-handed, takes the ball. Everett does that. Carl Everett. Carl Everett, yep. He does it, too, against uh, Jamie Moore. It's left-handed. A 1-0 pitch. Just wide, 2-0. Matsui on deck. Base is empty here in the fourth inning for the Yankees. To the shortstop. That's Garcia Paris. Offline drive, and that'll do it for the Yankees in the fourth. The Boston Red Sox carry a two run lead into the fifth inning of game one. Back after this from your local Fox station. Get it now. Fan is trying to do tonight after the game. So far, it's two nothing Boston as we go to the fifth. <laughs> Top of the order for the Red Sox as Todd Walker takes a pitch low. Four ball one. This Boston lineup, they had eight players with 80 or more RBIs this season, and that is a modern major league record. They say modern, they say 1900 on. That's over but low and the counts 2 and 0. Oh. It's only the second time this year that Todd Walker has hit in the leadoff spot. Johnny Damon has occupied that spot and as we said in our opener Damon will not be back until at least Saturday. So can you just clarify it for us Grady Little the manager of the Red Sox has said yeah that's real easy he has no chance of playing in these two games and we'll see about Saturday. He's still groggy. Walker reaches out and pokes one down the right field line. If it's fair, it's gone. It is a foul ball. A foul ball called by Angel Hernandez, the right field umpire, and it kind of looked like a fan reached around that pole. And now the home plate umpire, Tim McClellan, is overruled and called it a home run. It's 3 nothing. And now Joe Torre will argue. The question in my mind is how can the home plate umpire overrule when the first base umpire can't do that or the right field umpire. Well the right field umpire called it foul. So so the first base umpire is the closest the next closest. That's Angel Hernandez the right field umpire and now he's going to talk to the home plate umpire Tim McClellan as Terry Kraft the first base umpire. The three of them convened. Well again you've got three guys standing down that line. The right field umpire Angel Hernandez called it a foul ball. And as Tim said the first base umpire Terry Kraft didn't overrule it. It was the home plate umpire Tim McClellan and let's look. Oh it hit the pole. It hit the foul yeah. pole. Absolutely. The it fair pole. It definitely, it definitely hit it. But there, a fan, you're right, Joe, a fan did reach over and perhaps, perhaps pushed it to hit the foul pole or deflected it. There's a guy proud of himself. By the cell phone. It looked like, to me, it looked like the fan missed it and the ball hit off the pole. Looks like there's a... A change of direction right there. It appeared that it was. Looked to me like the change of direction came after it hit the pole. Perhaps. <laughs> so McClellan, the home plate umpire, the crew chief, overruled Angel Hernandez, and it's 3 0. I, I actually think, upon further consideration, that the fan may have gotten a coat on it or a hand on it. Or a piece of clothing. Miller goes the opposite way. Pretty well hit. Bernie Williams back on the road. What a catch. One out.
Everybody's been on the center field play of Bernie Williams, especially in the postseason and that game one against the Minnesota Twins in the division series. That was a tremendous catch going back into his right. Bernie had his left knee operated on May 27. He's had shoulder problems that go back to last year. Fine, fine play. The ball with enough hang time to give Bernie a chance to get back under it. Good thing the wall is padded. Bernie Williams, a guy who missed 42 games, had knee surgery. He has been bothered really by both shoulders and it's really affected his throwing but he is probably according to Joe Torre more sore with his shoulders than he is his knee which was surgically repaired earlier this season that pitch is low to Omar Garcia Parra one out nobody on and that makes it 2 and 0. So I don't know if we have settled the issue as to whether that ball was fair or foul. I thought it hit, it missed the fan, and it hit off that foul pole down the right field line, which would make it a fair ball. And I get the feeling you two guys don't agree. Uh, it was very, very close. I mean, the, the thing is, I mean, how did Tim McClellan reverse the call so easily? That's the thing that strikes me. I mean, he immediately called it fair. Joe Torrey came out, argued a little. Angel Hernandez and Terry Kraft, the other two umpires down the right field line, said, well, you're right, we're wrong. Close. I thought it missed it. I thought it there was a misdirect there somewhere. I don't think it hit the pole. I think it hit his hand. Now whether it was fair enough, fair or foul, I don't know. Yeah. But I think it hit the fan's hand. Yeah, did he stick his hand out? If it did hit his hand, as Garciaparra goes down on strikes, that's a good split finger fastball there. But if it did hit his hand, did it hit it before it had a chance to hit the pole? It was very, very close. So with two out and nobody on, here is Manny Ramirez. One for two. He singled off Messina's glove in front of the two run home run by Ortiz back in the fourth. That's an interesting ball hit by Walker at Fenway Park. It's probably fair by five feet, wrapping around that pesky pole. Another look coming of that ball down the line. And that's low and away, one ball, one strike. That is the pole. That was a fair ball. And even if it hit the hand in front of the pole, yeah, you're right. It's a fair ball. That's right. Here's one into right that's got a chance. At the wall, off the bat of Ramirez, a leap and it's gone. A two-homer inning for Boston, and they've doubled their lead. It's 4-0. A three homer game for the Red Sox against Messina who gave up 21 during the regular season. Well this is more like what people expected out of the Red Sox coming into the playoffs. This was a team that set major league records for extra base hits total bases and slugging percentage breaking a record held by the 27 Yankees. And in the division series, they were shut down for the most part by that Oakland athletic pitching staff. And it is a different story as Ortiz hammers one foul down the right field line. What we were talking about earlier about that blue monster in right field. Everybody critical of the green monster in Boston falls just fire out of this ballpark it's a band box Yankee Stadium's a band box so with two out nobody on Ortiz a 
swing and bunt, and Posada out to make the play. But two more runs for the Red Sox. The disputed home run. First pitch to Matsui. Float tie for ball one from Wakefield. It's now 4 0 Boston. We're in the bottom of the fifth. And it will be Matsui, Boone, and Nick Johnson. Like a curveball. At least it had that effect, and the count evens at a ball and a strike. That's low, two and one. Steve Palermo is an umpiring supervisor and is here representing the league. We'll hear from him after Matsui does something, talking about Todd Walker's fourth home run of this postseason, which ties a Red Sox record for a single postseason. Nomar hit four in 1999. That's hard hit. There's Walker to his left. Had to wait for Millar to get to the bag one up. Let's go down to Kenny Albert. All right, Joe, with supervisor of umpires, Steve Palermo. Steve, tell us about the controversial home run. Well, the ball was struck down the right field line, Kenny, and Angel Hernandez, the uh, right field line umpire, saw the ball as being to the right of the foul pole. And we had a discussion in the locker room prior to the game that we want 12 eyes. We have uh, six sets of eyes, all 12 eyes on anything that it, it looks like it, it could become controversial. And in this case, very, very close play down the right field line. Tim McClellan comes right away. He's 150% sure that that play needs to be overruled. He comes right away. They overrule. This way, uh, and, and we've always stressed that we want to get the play right. And this way, it doesn't look like Tim is being coerced into something. He comes right away with it without any appeal from the opposing manager. So the home plate umpire, Tim McClellan, made the call. Thanks, Steve. Joe. All right, Kenny, thanks. And it's something that the NFL has done for years, and it's something that we've seen more and more of the past few years. Umpires willing to get together to get the call right. On one and one. Boone pops it up into left center. Kapler, who's taken the place of the injured Johnny Damon, makes the play two out. Who are the umpires that are with us tonight? It's Tim McClellan behind the plate. Terry Kraft, Alfonso Marquez, Daryl Cousins, Joe West, and Angel Hernandez. He's the one who called that ball foul initially. I think the biggest difference as you look at that gentleman who touched the ball, or apparently touched the ball, the biggest difference is no fan can interfere with the ball in play like they can in baseball. Can't do it in football. Basketball, you're too far away. Hockey, they have the glass partition up. With two out, nobody on. Here's Nick Johnson. In for a strike, one and one. Spike Lee in the NBA may interfere with the ball in play. He may Nicholson. be. Jack Nicholson, Diane Cannon. I know she's uh, interfered. That's up and in. Two balls and a strike on Nick Johnson. But your point is well taken nonetheless. Calvin Klein, I think he gets into the action. 2 1 pitch to the right side for Walker. And after his teammates tacked on two more. We move into the sixth inning and Mike Messina back to the hill. This one's up the middle off the bat of Millar. Great range, good throw, but safe. As Nick Johnson could not dig it out. Good strong throw, but too far to go and not enough time to do it. Yeah, he ranged a long way from that ball. <laughs> That's all you got? That's all I got. Come on. What about the throw? It's, I'll tell you what, for that play and how far he went, that was a good throw. Yeah, I was going to say. Know? I mean, and that's got to be the toughest pick. throw you've got. It? It's probably the toughest one going away from the play. But that's when they talk about Soriano and, and moving the outfield. When I've seen him play, I've, me, I've seen him make a lot of just great, great plays like that because he's so athletic and he is so fast. But one on, nobody out. First pitch is on the inside corner to Trot Nixon. I think that play right there with Soriano going to his right proves what we were talking about earlier about how athletic he is and can be moved to center field next year, perhaps. I think when you talk about second baseman, as far as sheer range getting the balls, he can get to balls uh, that, you know, balls that 
no other guy can really get to just because he is so quick. That pitch misses as Supon and Arroyo get loose. You know I make that play. Right there. Oh, you <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's Standing just, still. Let's just get that straight. Standing still. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Sorry. <laughs> Supon was added to the list before this round as Byung Hun Kim is not on this ALCS roster for the Boston Red Sox. Nixon tries to hold up but can't. A lot of times if long relievers guys who come into the first three innings if they don't get in by the fifth they figure they've got to get their throwing in so I assume that's why Supon and Arroyo were up then if it becomes an extra inning game and it goes to the 15th one of the one of the two would would enter the game one would and could enter the game Nixon pops it up on the infield for Jeter one on one out. So this Boston attack which is four runs on seven hits has completely taken this big Yankee Stadium crowd out of it. Now Doug Mirabelli walks in with Millar at first one out Kapler on deck. Anybody surprised to see two guys warming up for the Red Sox out in their bullpen. I think they're just throwing. I think they're getting their throwing in. I assume that. I said, you know, if they don't get in by the first three innings, then they go ahead and get their throwing in. And then if it's an extra inning ball game, they come back later. But, I mean, Wakefield's been too effective unless he unless he's hurt. Nothing indicates why he should be hurt, though. They didn't broken a sweat yet. No. One on, one out, one ball, no strikes on Mirabelli. That is down and in. 2 0. We've seen a lot of 2 0 counts from Mike Messina. He has fallen behind quite a few hitters and has paid the price, allowing three home runs this evening. Tomorrow it's Andy Pettit. I don't know if he has ever gone through a stretch where he's thrown the ball any better, considering what he did in that game, too, against Minnesota. Jeter can't get to it to his right. Mirabelli is on and it's two on with one out for Boston here in the sixth. It appeared to me that Derek Jeter dived over the ball then. Yeah, ball went under his glove. Of course, he, he, I don't guess he's in a position for the ball to go under his glove unless he does dive. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I'm, we've all done it. And, it, you know, up here it looks, yeah, well, we see him make that play all the time, but. When you when you commit to the dive, sometimes you overdo it, and you know, and, and you want to kick yourself when you get up. But uh, when you commit to the dive, sometimes you just overdo it. It takes a little different hop on you, and something like that happens. Kapler now is 0 for 2 tonight. He bats with two on and one out. Got that off the end of the bat. Bernie Williams calls in out number two. Runners hold. It's first and second, two out. Let's check in again with Jeannie Zelasko for a game break. Well, what are you thinking? Alex Gonzalez making noise in Chicago. You know Alex Gonzalez is shortstop. Alex Gonzalez is shortstop for the Cubs. Nothing the Marlins Alex Gonzalez can do about that one. Ten nothing. Chicago bottom five. Three in the postseason, two in the NLCS for Gonzalez. And Joe Torre with Todd Walker coming up. The homer his last time up. It appears that Torrey's going to go to the bullpen. So a pitching change for the Yankees here in the sixth with two on and two out. Commercial interruption by the Nets Ford F-150. It's Felix Heredia coming out of the Yankee bullpen. And Todd Walker got a good rip at that first pitch from Heredia. As we mentioned earlier, Chris Hammond has been left off this ALCS roster and the two lefties in the bullpen for the Yankees were added very late Gabe White and Felix Heredia reason for that is Chris Hammond is not deemed a guy who can get left handers out consistently but Heredia and, and White are they're guys that throw hard and can run the ball in on the left handed batters Chris Hammond can't do that and this is a Boston lineup that features some pop yeah. from the left side it's Millar at second. 
Mirabelli on at first. Two on, two out. Sixth inning, four nothing Boston here in game one. O2 pitch. Nick Johnson cradles it and decides finally to take it himself. That'll do it for the Red Sox. They strand two. They have left six. We go to the bottom of the sixth. Four nothing Boston. Tim Wakefield has pitched brilliantly as we go to the bottom of the sixth inning. He has allowed the Yankees only two hits. And he misses high with ball one. It's four nothing Boston. Bullpen is quiet for the Red Sox. Juan Rivera takes a strike and it's one and one. Rivera the only strikeout tonight for Wakefield. Off the hands back toward the backstop and off the screen to make it one and two. Dick Allen. He was a teammate of yours as well. Mm -hmm. I never worry about it. I just take my three swings and go sit on the bench. There's more to that quote. Dick said by by doing something other than that, he'd get in a slump. So he didn't want a slump. So he just went up with swing three times, never come close to it, and that way he'd keep his swing in order. Maybe he hit a home run on the third swing. You never know. <laughs> he had a lot of them. 351 to be exact. That's off the end of the bat. Shallow center. Kapler coming on. One out. Let's check in with Kenny Albert, who is in the upper deck. Yes, Joe. High in the upper deck, behind the foul pole. The teenager who made contact with the home run ball was sitting in this very seat. He was bombarded by reporters, so he left Yankee Stadium. His seatmate, Ed Hillel of Manhattan. Ed, what did you see? Uh, the person that was sitting in the seat where you are leaned over slightly like this. Ball hit his hand and dropped down. If the ball didn't hit his hand, I think it would have just went right over here and everybody would have saw it was foul. But in your view, after it hit his hand, did it hit, did it glance off the foul pole? No, went straight down after it hit his hand. Definitely a foul ball. All right, thanks, Ed. You hear what the Yankee fans think, Joe? Yeah, I think that's the key. <laughs> Absolutely not. An objective report, no, in no. the least, no. Ed was confident that this ball clearly would have gone foul. <laughs> it would have been at least, that'd have been 10 to 12 feet foul easily. Oh yeah, in Ed's view, in Ed's view. All right, Ed, do there's it, Ed. Ed. I did it. I did it, guys. I did it. I told him it would have been foul. I want to uh, know how many 16-year-olds leave when they get reporters <laughs> asking them questions. Yeah, it's time to shine. Jeter on deck with one out, nobody on. Ed looked satisfied that he had told the story to the nation. I don't. I think he's got to check the honesty policy. Yeah. Not so sure it was true. One two pitch. Because we all know it is the policy. <laughs> with two oh. out, nobody on. <laughs> Classic. Jeter will come to the plate. One more shot. Now, now check Ed out. <laughs> there's, there's, is that Ed right Where's there? he looking? I think that's Ed. That was Ed, wasn't it? <laughs> so how does Ed know whether it's foul or not? Ed's behind the pole. No, Ed was looking at the left field foul pole. Oh. Come on, Kenny. <laughs> oh, Ed, how do you do it? <laughs> Great seats, huh, buddy? <laughs> With two out, nobody on. That's why that kid left. He got sick of the view. <laughs> Looking at a yellow pole all game. And they did. <laughs> to third, caught by Miller. Signed Miller knew they had signed a very good defensive third baseman. Kind of more in the category of a good contact hitter. Little did they know they would get a guy that would hit 326 with 19 home runs. 85 RBIs, a switch hitting third baseman, a very good glove man. They liked him so much, they traded away Shea Hillenbrand during the season and got Byung Hun Kim, who, by the way, got a huge ovation from the Yankee Stadium fans when he was introduced along the baseline before the game with his history against the Yankees, both this season 
and a couple of years ago in the World Series while with Arizona and as we said Kim who was diagnosed with a sore shoulder is not on the roster for Grady Little this round yeah, it leads one to believe that uh, were it not for the horrible experiences two years ago Miller hits it hard but Jeter to his left throws it over to first Tim hold that thought 11 to 1 another pitching change here after Miller grounded out with Nomar coming up back to the bullpen go the Yankees it's Nelson the the upper deck didn't like the fact that somebody was wearing it grabbed it and threw it down onto the screen as Nomar Garcia Parra bats with one out nobody on here in the seventh four nothing Boston. Our sprint virtual manager question are dynasties good for baseball. Our answer 69 percent of you said yes. Twenty six time world champions are the New York Yankees down four to nothing in game one of his ALCS. One ball one strike. The numbers for Nelson who started the season with you Brett in Seattle. Guys, close. It sure sounds like it. Jeff? Oh, sure. I play with Jeff a lot. <laughs> what do you want me to say? I don't know. No, Nellie's a good guy, and he was he was a big part of our team for the last three years. And, you know, they made the trade. Uh, actually, at the second deadline, he's in the postseason. I'm not. One ball, two strikes. Garcia Parra takes a pitch inside, and really, he was a guy, Tim, that they let walk away here a couple of years ago, and they just never found the right combination to fill in for him so they went out and got him back traded Armando Benitez to get him got him back but the problem he's had he can't throw strikes swinging bunt tough play for Posada good play with Nick Johnson reaching over the top to make the put out at first back to Jeannie Zelasco for another game break all right how many different ways can Tom Brunneman call a home run his journalistic wares are being tested because we got another one at Wrigley Miguel Cabrera last time the Marlins in the playoffs he was in grade school where you learn to count to 12 and that's how many home runs we've had in this series well that's amazing 2003 NLCS 30 total runs scored 45 combined hits, 27 for extra bases, 12 home runs, and 11 2 Chicago lead in the sixth inning. Manny Ramirez takes the ball high with two out, nobody on. I've been thinking about a point that you brought up several innings ago, Joe, about whether to take Mark Pryor out of the game uh, right now, an 11 2 game in the sixth inning. I mean, after all, Pryor's only going to pitch one more time. For the Cubs, if it goes to six or seven, and I would imagine it would be either game five or six, five in Florida, or more likely game six back in Chicago. And what do you think? No, you leave him in? I think so. Yeah. One ball, one strike, two out, nobody on. Ramirez takes ball two. I'm sure they'll go with the pitch count, 110 pitches or 115 pitches, and then remove it. I mean, they're probably thinking, too, is there a big difference between 80 pitches or 110? They're still going to give him his four days. Right, right. I mean, there's one thing being 30 pitches and 100. That's too far inside, three and one. The only reason why I brought it up in the first place is he's a young guy sure, been sure. over 100 pitches time after time yep. he had that long start against the Braves you have a nine run sixth inning lead you can get him a little break in my opinion yep. and I guess my opinion a lot two out a base hit into right off the bat of Manny Ramirez and David Ortiz will come to the plate against Jeff Nelson. Ortiz got the scoring started back in the fourth inning. An infield hit by Ramirez off Messina's glove. And then after being down 0-2, Ortiz worked it full and hit a home run to the front part of the upper deck into right field to make it 2-0. And solo shots by Walker and Ramirez 
and it's four nothing thanks to the pitching of Tim Wakefield. Fastball for a strike to Ortiz. How about the three hits uh, in Manny Ramirez's last three at bats? You mentioned the pitch or the hit off of Lucina's glove, and then a wall scraper in right field. It came down just on the other side of the, of the fence. And now a jam shot to right. After going through that division series, he will take three hits. Absolutely. No matter the shape or form. Sure. One and one on Ortiz. Ortiz and they will send David down to first with two on two out and bring Millar to the plate. So hit by a pitch to put two on. That slider slid too far. It hits Ortiz in the back leg. Better view right here. Like you hit him right on top of the left foot. Out. Dottlemeyer will come out and talk to Nelson as his crowd gets on Ortiz, who still isn't down to first base. Dogs are barking. Woof. That was good. Here comes Grady Little, and there it's taken Ortiz so long to get down there. The trainer and Grady Little are going to come out and check on him, although Grady says, Well, I'll let my trainer go down there. I'll just stand here and talk to the club. What a, what a riveting series the Red Sox played in Oakland. They lose two to the Athletics, and then because of strange, strange base running, they lose game three to the Red Sox. A great block of home by Jason Veritek. Trot Nixon wins game three with the home run. David Ortiz wins game four with the double in the eighth inning. And then the big hit by Manny Ramirez in game five. And Oakland once again bites the dust for the fourth year in a row. Here's Millar with two on, two out. And a strike on the outside corner. Grady Little is unsigned past this year. And if Grady Little has done anything, and I think he's accomplished a lot of things with the Red Sox. Already, yep. He has brought this group together. It was never a team known for the chemistry the last few years and this is a team that has everybody believing in one another pulling the same way so the atmosphere that he has put together and helped foster down in the clubhouse in the dugout is in my opinion a big reason why they're still playing and the A's are at home watching they didn't quit after falling down two games to none as Millar takes ball one it's a completely different team than, than even two years ago as far as the atmosphere you know just the you can see it the aura that they have about them it's it's a team that has fun and uh, it's just been on a heck of a run the two on two out one ball two strikes on Millar left side off the glove of Jeter here comes a runner to the plate Ramirez no play and it's five to nothing Boston in the seventh Millar gets his first RBI of this postseason, and it comes on a base hit off Jeter's glove into left. Derek Jeter separating his shoulder in the first game of the year, opening night in Toronto, and we've seen two plays tonight that if he doesn't make, he at least feels. He can keep that ball in front of him, but that left shoulder's got to be giving him problems, and it has throughout the second half of the season. Not an excuse, just a fact. And now another pitching change for the Yankees, who hardly had to dip into their bullpen other than Rivera in the division series, will use their fourth pitcher of the night. Nelson will give way to Gabe White. D. Gabe White, who was picked up from Cincinnati at the trade deadline, takes over and misses Lone away with ball one. When they picked up White, the Yankees picked up a pitcher that was on the disabled list with a groin injury. They knew he was on his way back feeling better. They waited for him to get right, and he's been impressive. He has really impressed Joe Torre. 
as that hits the outside corner one ball one strike on Trot Nixon two on two out a run home five nothing Boston here in the seventh inning. Nixon tonight, one for two, grounds a base hit into right. They will bring Ortiz and now hold him late. And the bases are loaded with two out. Mike Cubbage came way down the line, and Red Rivera coming up with it and put the brakes on Ortiz to load the bases. The reason the third base coach will do that is to see if the right fielder handles the ball cleanly. If he does, you stop Ortiz for two reasons. He's slow to begin with. And he was hit on the left foot with a pitch from Jeff Nelson. Once Rivera fields it cleanly, Ortiz will take the, the wide turn, but a very slow runner with a sore foot. So. And the bases are loaded with two out for Mirabelli. He's one for three. Strike one from White. So here are the Red Sox who were on death's door after two games against the A's, especially in the fashion by which they lost game one. They went three in a row against the A's. And now they are on their way unless the Yankees rally to a fourth victory in succession. They have had two base runners in six innings tonight against Wakefield. Yeah, and that first game against the Twins, they just played shabby baseball, throwing the ball all over the plate, losing three to one. But as this Yankee team has proven time and time again, they came back to beat the Twins. No contest in any of those three games. Going two on Mirabelli. Still on two. Well, to me, if the Yankees have had a tough time replacing Jeff Nelson, they had to reacquire him. The guy they never did replace after letting him walk away to the Mets is Mike Stanton. They tried with Hammond. He's not even on the ALCS roster. They added Heredia and Gabe White late. 0 2 pitch. One ball, two strikes. Stanton ended up signing with the Mets. But for so many years, the Stanton Nelson tandem leading up to Mariano Rivera it was very difficult for American League hitters. Mendoza. Mero Mendoza with the Red Sox now, but not on the 25 man roster. Mirabelli hits one on one hop to the second baseman Soriano, and the inning is over, but not before. The Red Sox come up with another. They are having fun in game one. The house in Ruth built, trying to exercise some ghosts in this series. The knuckleball of Tim Wakefield has been dancing tonight. He's allowed only two hits through six innings. It was David Ortiz who got the scoring started. With a 3-2 pitch, he hit into the upper deck. The disputed home run, first called foul, then overruled by McClellan. Fair ball. It was 3-0. Manny Ramirez that same inning in the fifth made it 4-0. A run in the seventh. It's time to stretch. It's 5-0 Boston here in the Bronx. I mean, it's second to none in all the sports, I believe. And it's fun. I mean, this is going to be a fun time. Yeah, everyone says, you know, we played him towards the end of the year. Does it get any bigger than that? Well, yeah, it does. And this is it. And this is it. And so far, it's 5 nothing Boston. Bottom of the seventh inning. And the three, four, and five hitters for the Yankees coming up. Giambi, Williams, and Posada. Well, if Supon and Arroyo were warming earlier just to get some work in, the bullpen is serious and active and getting ready for the Red Sox in the bottom of the seventh. It's high for ball one. There is a big difference in pitchers warming up in the fifth inning, particularly when your team's way ahead and warming up in the seventh. They mean business now. 
That's in for a strike, even though Mirabelli didn't catch it in the count one and one. Giambi, four out of 18 in the postseason. Two and one. Surprised everybody. A fastball to Giambi. Alan Embry and Mike Timlin getting loose. Three balls and a strike. I would imagine he'll get another fastball. Good hitting situation right here. A leadoff walk. A game break while we play in the bottom of the seventh. Back to Los Angeles. And in the immortal words of Greg Maddox, ticks dig the long ball. So, ladies, we got more trouble in Chicago. Alex Gonzalez did the damage. Second of the game, 13 home runs in this series. 12-2 Cubs, bottom seven. Jeannie, thanks. Here, this crowd is starting to climb into it with Bernie Williams at the plate. After the first walk of the night is issued by Wakefield to Giambi. I think if you're sending Embry into the ball game, Grady Little looking at Dave Wallace, who took over for Tony Cloninger as a pitching coach in midseason. I think you send Mirabelli out there and talk to him. Three and oh. Yeah, you want to slow the game down. I mean, Embry's ready, but if you're going to bring him in to pitch to Posada, you want to make sure he's ready. Two on, nobody out. Eight out of nine balls, and that's going to be it for Tim Wakefield. You've got the switch hitting Posada, followed by the left-handed hitting Matsui. And it'll be the lefty Embry. The Yankees making noise in the seventh, down by five. Well, the Boston Red Sox could not have hoped for anything more out of Tim Wakefield. He allows no runs, two hits. But with a 5 nothing lead, the first two hitters have reached on back-to-back -back walks. And here is Alan Embry. And he will turn Posada around and make him bat right-handed. With fans in New England holding their breath, Posada, who's one for two, steps in. Not only an RBI double to score one, but to push Yankees to third and to second, respectively. 
with nobody out. Fine play by Kapler to keep this ball from going to the wall. Giambi scores easily. Williams to third. Posada with a double. And the ghosts of Yankee Stadium come alive. Up right Terry, I've seen him. <laughs> There's nothing like it. There's nothing like Yankee Stadium. Uh, I've seen those ghosts more, more than enough, more than my fair share. Second and third, nobody out. And Suey takes the ball. the pitching coach is going to come out and talk to Embry who is missing high every pitch has been around the letters even the one Posada hit well they from game three on the Boston bullpen in the division series against Oakland went nine and two thirds innings allowed no runs on two hits. It's second and third with nobody out here in game one. Five one Red Sox two and oh on that suit. A little flare into left. Manny Ramirez will haul it in and flip it into third. It's a 5-2 game on a sack fly by Matt Stewart. <laughs> now it's Aaron Boone. Excuse me, Joe. There's a situation where if you're going to have them score a run, a sack fly to left field is not the worst thing that can happen because you kept the runner at second base. Boone is 0 for 2. Runner at second, one out. The left handed hitting Nick Johnson on deck. Ball one. You had second and third and nobody out. And you hit the ball to right field. You not only score the runner, but you move the runner from second to third base. Now Posada can't run, bottom of your screen. Williams does, but there's one out with a runner on at second base. Two and oh. Aaron Boone is three out of 17 in the postseason. Two and one. Boone hit 18 home runs in 106 games with the Reds and six home runs in 54 games with the Yankees. Shallow center. In comes Kapler. Two out. Oh boy, here. I thought it was interesting Gabe Kapler raising his right hand when nobody was around him. Perhaps thinking about the Damon Damian Jackson collision the other night. Watch the right hand go out and there's nobody around him. Well, that's a big out for Embry. They kept him in there because of Nick Johnson. The left handed hitting first baseman being in the on deck circle. Now the Red Sox get lefty on lefty here as the Yankees have scored two trail by three in the seventh. One way or the other this is most likely Alan Embry's last hitter of the night. 
Ball one. Well, if Boston brings in the right-hander, you may be you may see Ruben Sierra hitting with runners on. Sierra a switch hitter and can counter Brady Little bringing in the right-hander. One and one. That was his best fastball since coming in. Tailing to Kepler, and the inning is over. The Yankees come up with two. Good work by Embry to limit the damage. Into the eighth, 5 2 Boston. We welcome you back to Yankee Stadium, game one, 5 2 Boston, as we move to the eighth inning. Joe Buck, Tim McCarver, and Brett Boone with you. It's 11 1 on the scoreboard clock. Gabe White is back to the hill, and his first pitch is high to Gabe Kepler. Hitless tonight. Gabe to Gabe. And a fly ball into right field. Back is Rivera. Four out number one. Tonight's game summary is brought to you by Nissan. Great start by Tim Wakefield tonight for the Boston. And Ortiz and Ramirez have also gone deep. First pitch is high to the man who hit. <laughs> The home run, and Ed is an instant star. <laughs> All right, Ed. Somebody's got to be telling him he's on. Here's a 1-0 pitch. 2-0 the count. Teenager leaves. Ed becomes a star. <laughs> the story at 1130. We understand that he's doing a radio interview right now, so he is an instant star. <laughs> he's on roll. Here's a 2-0 pitch. Outside, 3-0. Mike, <laughs> the mad dog, and Ed. <laughs> What's he saying? You know, I was just there, and, uh, you know, I happened to catch it out of the corner of my eye. and clear, Clearly a foul ball. Here's a 3-0 pitch. It's a strike to Walker. On deck is Miller. It's 5-2 here in the eighth. 3-1. Up the middle, Todd Walker in that leadoff spot as Homer did now single tonight. One on, one out. Miller coming up. You've got Miller now, and then Garcia Parra and Ramirez, and there is action for the Yankees in their bullpen as Jackson will pinch run for Walker. So they'll add to their defense, and get maybe a touch more speed on the bases. Damian Jackson. Damian Jackson, who was part of that collision with Johnny Damon in center field, game five on Monday night. Takes over, and then we'll go in and play second base. Contreras is getting loose for the Yankees in their bullpen. Damian uh, has a slight laceration uh, over his right eye. And there's Contreras. Contreras did not appear in that division series against Minnesota. That's low. Ball one to Miller. It's interesting looking out at the Red Sox bullpen. And Juan Rivera leads it off the Yankees in the bottom of the eighth inning. I think Grady, uh, Grady Little is going to perhaps send Embry back out there. I mean, who would you rather face? Juan Rivera or Ruben Sierra? One on, one out. Miller takes strike one. So 
So Mike Timlin is ready. He is another big reason why the Red Sox advanced. The job he did out of the bullpen. And then Scott Williamson. Even today, you read quotes by Grady Little, the manager of the Red Sox, saying, We played 167 games and we still don't have a closer. In the same situation we were coming out of spring training. Williamson, right now, you would think, though, would be the guy until further notice, even though he walked the only two hitters he faced on Monday night in the ninth inning in Oakland. Quiet Yankee Stadium waits for a 1 1 pitch. Jackson took off too soon. The throw down. He is out. Two out. Caught stealing 1 3. 4. Yep. 6. Yep. 4. Soriano. Look at Nick Johnson. The throw is perfect. Throw's got to be on the inside part of the bag. And a second baseman gets inside in a situation like that. Yep. So it is Soriano taking the throw. Perfect throw from Johnson. And it's two out, nobody on with Miller waiting for a 1 1. Two and one. If the Red Sox do hang on and win this, the Yankees will be asking. Pretty much the same out of Andy Pettit, who goes in game two tomorrow night. Same thing they asked of him in the division series against the Twins. Miller pops it up, and that will send us into the bottom of the eighth. It will be the number nine man, Rivera, at least his spot due to lead off, and Soriano and Jeter. It's 5 2 Boston here in New York. Surprise on the mound for the most part, and then it's Mike Timlin. I wouldn't have done this. I would have left uh, Alan Embry in the game to pitch to Juan Rivera. And, you know, it may be a moot point if, if uh, Sierra makes an out, but I'd rather see Embry pitch to Rivera if I'm a Red Sox fan than Timlin pitch to, or I beg your pardon, Embry pitch to. Well, I think they're, right, that's right. I think they're figuring it's a, they got a three run lead. Worst scenario is Ruben hits a home run. They still got a two run lead. I think if it was a different situation, they wouldn't want him up there with the runners out there. So that is the matchup. It's Timlin against Sierra with Soriano and Jeter to follow. If anybody gets on in the inning, Giambi. 5 2 Boston, bottom of the eighth. That good Mike Timlin fastball, 94 miles per hour for strike one. There are the numbers for the much maligned bullpen for the Boston Red Sox. That missed the outside corner, one and one. Something off, and the count's one and two. Sometimes what appears to be an off speed pitch is just a fastball gripped tighter. BP fastball. Yeah. Timlin has Sierra set up, and a line drive caught by Millar. One away. And even though he doesn't get on, Tim, your point is well taken. Yeah. Ball hit hard, but right at the law. Yeah, a lot of things that managers have to uh, think about. You're trying to play the probabilities as much as you can. Embry would have only faced Rivera anyway, because Tim Lee, Timlin most certainly would have come out to face Soriano and Joe Torre now, out to talk to Tim McClellan. I think to check Timlin for something. So whether this is gamesmanship or if there's something I don't 
Uh, maybe it's the necklace. Who knows? Jimlin's getting a smile out of it. He's allowed to wear that cap, by the way. He is. That's regulation cap. <laughs> Or whatever it was, I mean, that really wasn't much of a check. <laughs> Those pictures, they all cheat. That's, yeah, <laughs> there you are, back to that. I'll tell you that. I like those guys. With one out, nobody on. A fastball for a strike. Remember earlier in the year with Roger Clemens going after win number 300. The Boston Red Sox complained about that glove that Clemens said was issued by Major League Baseball that had that patch on it, commemorating win number 300 before he got it. A few weeks later, a few plane tickets later, a few luxury suites purchased later, Roger Clemens finally got it back here on a Friday night against St. Louis. Soriano chops it. It's one and two. We go back in time. May 26th. Looking for win number 300. And Grady Little and the hitters thought it was distracting, so he took off the commemorative glove and got the old one. And didn't get the win. But whatever it was, Joe Torre went back and had a little chuckle about it. And Timlin didn't appear to be bothered by it at all. With one out, nobody on, a one-two pitch. Two and two. On two and two. A high fastball, two out. Let's check in again with Jeannie, who's busy in Los Angeles. Oh, yes. Mark Pryor, by the way, avoided the Wazen police, but he could not avoid Dusty Baker. Get the kid Cubby out of there. He went seven, gave up three runs on eight hits in his first LCS start. Five strikeouts, two walks, 116 pitches. I could go on, and I will. 11 and one since coming off the DL. Impressive. 12, three Cubbies, top nine. Jeannie, thanks. Dave Veers took over. They're in the ninth inning, 12 3. So the Cubs on their way to evening that series at a game apiece before it goes to South Florida. Here's Jeter. Derek 0 for 3. That's high ball one. With two out and the base is clear. There's more action for the Red Sox in their bullpen as Jeter pops it up. Right side, Millar gives it a look. More great work from Mike Timlin. He comes in and has a 1-2-3 eighth inning. The Red Sox in the ninth will start it with Garcia Parra. They lead the Yankees by three. And dealing with Garcia Parra, Ramirez and Ortiz is Jose Contreras. First year, and it was actually the Yankees who outbid the Red Sox for his services, prompting Larry Lucchino, president of the Red Sox, to term the Yankees as the evil empire. That's where that started this year. I think the I think the Mariners ran on it too. We lost. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you get into a bidding war with the Yankees and they really want somebody, they're going to get it. And they got Contreras, and I think, Tim, if you're Joe Torre, you know, this is an opportunity to see a guy who didn't pitch in the division series. Right. And see what you have. I mean, you've got a, you've got spots available to try to get the ball in the hands of Rivera as this series wears on, and this is kind of an audition for Contreras. That's one of the reasons for his effectiveness. That split finger fastball that is so elusive darts one way and then another. There it was again. And a quick and easy out as Garcia Parra strikes out. Wicked splitter. 
from Contreras. After Larry Lucchino had said that the Yankees were the evil empire, and George Steinbrenner came back and fired the second salvo, saying that Larry Lucchino was a chameleon, saying that he was a he, he was a chameleon because he changed changed colors being in San Diego. Ramirez sticks the bat out and gets a base hit into right. When he was in San Diego, of course, San Diego, a small market club. Boston Red Sox, a big market club. So George's point was that you can't be a small market guy and now all of a sudden come to a big market and take the other side. Right. <laughs> One it, way or the other. It's the other side of the quote, though, that you never hear is when he said, the Yankees, the evil empire, and I want to be Princess Leia. That was the weird part. <laughs> One on one out a base hit by Ramirez and David Ortiz is at the plate. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. I don't get into that upper management rigmarole. Yeah right. <laughs> For a rebuttal we will patch you into Seattle <laughs> where the brain trust of the Mariners have something to say. One ball no strikes on David Ortiz who hit a home run for the first runs of the night. Contreras made him look bad. One ball, one strike. Jose, one earned run in his last 17 innings pitch down the stretch. The action on that ball. Yeah, as you can see, very little spin. That ball darting down in the out of the strike zone. Very few effective split finger fastballs are ever strikes. I would say none. <laughs> Have long, strong fingers right there. Woo. Mr. Splitty does what he wants it to do. What he darn well pleases. That's our Mr. Splitty. One ball, two strikes. Ortiz checks it, it squirts away, and Ramirez was ready to run. Good base running by Manny Ramirez, and he's down to second. Very good base running. If you're not ready on the balls of your feet, body moving towards second base, the pass ball is is not the type that you would normally take an extra base. It is a wild pitch, but Ramirez was ready, and now a hit could add to the lead. Ortiz strikes out, two out. Before the game, I told Brett Boone, I said, I'm glad I'm here. If I had one choice, I'd want to be here. And Brett said, not me. I'd want to be down there. <laughs> I'd rather be on the field. <laughs> Absolutely. Understandable, too. Well, Millar is at the plate with a runner at second, two out. You see the final at the bottom of your screen. So the series is tied 1-1, and it's Mark Pryor. Second-year stud for the Cubs, who comes up with a victory. Home runs all over the place. And that series will go to South Florida for the weekend. By the way, as we said, coming up after the game, your late local news, except for those of you on the West Coast. Contreras digging after that ball in his glove working he's going to another one kind of an interesting shot really I mean when you consider the Yankees had Tim would take off his hat for whatever reason for that last pitch that ball was in his glove and he was digging on it but usually when they throw the split they're going to dig uh, on every pitch to, to so, so it throws the hitter off he's not going to just dig when he wants to split he's going to dig on the fastball and just adjust the grip once he gets it, once he gets it in his glove. On one and one. Stays inside. Two balls and a strike. I was going along the lines of scuffing it or something. Doing something to the baseball. I, I already told you. They all they all do it. You're convinced. No. But I'll tell you what. It's, it's easier to get away with than a hitter. 
Two balls and a strike. Not if you're Sammy yeah, Sosa. See, I mean, that was just coming. That that was right down Sixth Avenue. Sosa went deep tonight for the Cubs. Who did? Two and two. We look ahead to the bottom of the ninth inning. And it will be Better. the heart of the order. This Beyond is the first time Williams I've seen him. And This is your first look at Contreras? This is the first time I've seen him, you know. Especially live. We didn't face him all this year. His 2 2 pitch. He struck out the side. So if that was an audition, he passed. And we go to the bottom of the ninth inning of game one. It'll be the big bats coming up for the Yankees who trail Boston by three. It'll be Giambi, then Bernie Williams and Jorge Posada as we go to the bottom of the ninth inning. And I talked about the quote guys earlier from Grady Little saying we don't have a closer after 167 games. Well, if that's the case, it's interesting that Williamson is out on the mound right now as Robin Williams imploring this crowd to make some noise here in the bottom of the ninth inning. Well, I mean, from a Red Sox standpoint, if Timlin's throwing the ball as well as he would, why wouldn't he be allowed? He threw, he threw uh, 11 pitches in retiring three pretty good hitters, Ruben Sierra, Alfonso Soriano, and Derek Jeter. And now you bring in Williamson. I mean, are, it's a little late to start establishing a closing pitcher, don't you think? Yeah, I think that's I mean, a great point. Williamson is coming off that ninth inning, game five in Oakland. When either tired or charged up, he walked the first two hitters and it threw it all on low, who came in and did a phenomenal job to end the game and get the save. But there are the numbers combined with Cincinnati and Boston. When Scott came in the game on Monday night, he was high with everything. Obviously, the Yankees watching that game, and I would imagine Giambi will take a strike in this at bat. Williamson does not have a save regular season or postseason as a member of the Boston Red Sox. And against the heart of the order with a three run lead, here we go. With a big shift on in the infield, ball one high. And for a strike, it's one and one. It's a good time for a bunt, isn't it? <laughs> Almost every time Giambi hits, it's a good time for a bunt. Palmero. The left side of the infield wide open. The Yankees need base runners, but I'm sure it's not even a thought. And a fastball is blown right by Giambi's bat. It's one and two. That's a pitch that Jason Giambi has not been handling for the last month. He cannot catch up to the high fastball. Set up at one and two. Something other than the high fastball, and it's still one and two. One of the reasons for that is it's. You have to have a faster bat to hit the high fastball. The low fastball, you drop the bat head on it. The high fastball, you have to speed it up a yard. On one and two, Giambi takes ball two. You would think Williamson would be doing Giambi a favor, giving him anything but that chest high fastball. I think so. The Yankees looking for a spark. Still two and two.
If the Red Sox hang on and Wakefield gets the victory, it would be 11 years between postseason victories for Tim Wakefield, which is tied for fourth in the all time list for the longest amount of time between postseason wins. You get the feeling we're a long way from that. 2 2 pitch. Giambi leading off takes ball three. On the inside corner, one away. That looked like a slider. Look. Three runs up, and you throw a 3 2 slider. That gets a lot of left handers. Man. The only question was was Mirabelli going to pop up and throw it into left field? <laughs> he was going to throw it around the horn, look down there, and the only guy he was looking at was Manny Ramirez. His third baseman, Miller, was. Out by second base. Here's Bernie Williams with one out, nobody on. The Red Sox, two outs away from a huge game one victory. Leading by three. And a ball sinks low and away. Red Sox get on the board first. Two run shot by Ortiz in the fourth. Solo home runs in the fifth. A single tally in the seventh to make it five nothing five two after seven and now a one out to Bernie Williams as we play in the bottom of the ninth it's one and one Williamson on one and one. Hard hit right at Millar on one hop. Two up, two down. A matchup between these two franchises and the rivalry that is among the fiercest in all of professional sports. The curse and everything else that's gone into it. Sold here for the 1920 season. The Yankees have gone on to win 26 world champions since then. And the Red Sox, of course, have not won one since 1918. They would love to eliminate that sentence here in 2003. It's uttered year after year, postseason after postseason, as a strike. It's the inside corner to Posada. No doubt an advantage to New York getting the extra rest. Boston has to be worn out going coast to coast. Using Pedro Martinez, Derek Lowe in game five. Losing Johnny Damon in that collision, and yet here they are leading 5 2, one strike away from a victory here in game one. Ball, two strikes. Since 96, the Yankees have been involved in five LCS series, and they have lost a total of seven games. A one two pitch. Two balls, two strikes. Yeah, the Yankees have lost in the division series back in 1997 to Cleveland and then last year to Anaheim. With the bases empty two out a 2 2 pitch. Full count. 
Since divisional play began in 1969, the Yankees have been in the ALCS 10 times. They have lost the ALCS only once to Kansas City in 1980. We have a long way to go in this series, but the Red Sox could take a huge step forward with a win here tonight. 3-2 pitch with two out, nobody on. Posada checks his swing. Foul ball, and it's still 3-2. Nineteen eighty, by the way, that was the year the Yankees won one hundred and three regular season games. Dick Hauser, the manager, and he was fired after the season. Another three two pitch to Jorge Posada with two out in the ninth. Another foul. Wakefield gets the win. He'll be three and three in his career in the postseason. Messina staring at a four and four overall record in the postseason and an 0 and two record this year. It's Derek Lowe and Andy Pettit tomorrow night. And then Clemens and Pedro Martinez on Saturday. That is on the inside corner. The Red Sox have taken game one. Tim Wakefield going six plus innings allowing two runs on two hits and the bullpen picks up where it left off from game three of the division series against Oakland on Boston's won four in a row and they win a big game one here in the Bronx big pitching performance Tim Wakefield but Alan Embry coming on with runners on at second and third and allowing only one Yankee run and that plugged the gap. Yeah, I think I think you summed it up. I think you know Timmy came out and uh, did everything he was asked to do and more. And uh, they got a couple big home runs um, with Ortiz, Manny, Walker. And now a famous foul pole down the right field line. People are taking pictures with an inanimate object. <laughs> and Ed is still kissing there. it. And that's Big Ed still hanging out there. Is Ed up there? Oh. No, he's he's hit it. He's, he's got uh, Regis in the morning. He's <laughs> Regis and Kelly Ripa with Ed Hillel. Let's check in with Kenny Albert, who is down on the field. Kenny. All right, thanks very much, Joe. Tim Wakefield, very superstitious, does not want to step on the ALCS logo. How gratifying for you, Tim. 11 years in between postseason victories. You were left off the ALCS roster 99 against the Yankees. How gratifying. It's very gratifying. You know, I, I just feel blessed to be a part of a, such a great team that we have and to be able to start game one of a you know one of the hugest rivalries that there is in baseball and uh, and to come away victorious you know our, our team did a great job our offense came through and uh, it was unbelievable you guys have gone coast to coast now four times since the beginning of the postseason red eye flight from Oakland you landed eight o'clock yesterday morning are you guys just going out adrenaline yeah I, I am anyway um, tell all my friends don't call me tomorrow morning because I'm going to be sleeping in so uh, uh, I'm just excited that we got this first game in and we won and uh, now I'm looking forward to tomorrow. You allowed only two hits. Did you get the sense the Yankees were getting frustrated by the knuckleball? Uh, I don't know. Maybe I'm just trying to just concentrate on getting the first out of every inning. And uh, you know when that happens, it makes it a little easier. And my offense made it a lot easier for me tonight by scoring five runs off Moose. All right, Tim. Congratulations. Thank you. Tim Wakefield, the game one winner. Joe, back up to you. All right, Kenny. Thanks, and thanks for your help here tonight. My thanks to Brett Boone and Tim McCarver. <laughs> as they continue to look at that right field foul ball. That'll be here tomorrow night, and so will we. For Brett Boone, Tim McCarver, I'm Joe Buck, coordinating producer of Major League Baseball on Fox, and the producer of today's game, Michael Weissman. The director is Bill Webb. Take producer Aaron Stoikov, and as always, our thanks to Steve Horn assisting us here in the booth. The associate director, Kathy Hunt, the broadcast associates, Eric Billigmeyer and David Duvall. Jerry 